Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. Hi, I'm Matt Pison, and you're listening to Otaku Generation, the best place on the web, and you guys get to be here for another 20 hours! What's Reesh? What's Bank? Well, you know who to bank. It's Ellen and the boy. Welcome to the show 947. This is our Otakon show. Uh, I'm Alan. I am Matt. And I am Simon. Yep. Yay. Uh, so we have a Simon in the room. Uh, Special guest star. Yeah. Uh, Paul was not feeling well. And we are recording sort of off our schedule because of Otakon. We'll sort of skip what's free. So we'll just sort of talk uh, casually about Otakon. Um, so Matt, I saw your, your niece, Cora. Yay. Yeah. So she and I, I got her on the film documentary. So um, I, you know, I haven't pulled that off the drive yet. And so I got to go take a look at all that stuff. Yeah, so uh, so what did you do this Otacon, Alan? You were doing like uh, con coverage, videography again? Yeah, so kind of what I'm doing for the film documentary really isn't part of the media productions and con coverage. Um, now I I'm covering stuff, but I'm covering stuff differently. Planning on producing a, a documentary at the end, or is this just sort of like a piecemeal kind of ongoing project? So it's a combination of things. When there are things to clip, I will clip out something, and that will get to the media productions group or that will get to like main events for them to throw into a reel or something like that or for the social media team so this year what what uh what nori did is he took the membership badges not staff badges the membership badges yeah had these lenticular lenses on them and they had Ooh. designs so you move them and he had i don't know how do you simon do you know how many variations there were i would think there were uh full weekend Friday, Saturday, Sunday, individual badges, children's badges. So there's at least five that were the lenticulars. And then there were several badges that were not like the industry, the contractors, Dealers, the guests. That sort of stuff. Yeah. Right. But yeah. so the lenticular ones, like you would move it and something would change. Like it could be a yeah. scene. It could be something as basic as the words Otakon went from one color to silver or something like that. Because wow. it's harder to counterfeit. Ha, ha, ha. Um, but either case. And because it looked cool for our theme of trains yeah. this year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How did the, the theme of trains oh, turn out? Oh, it's amazing. Um, we, it was chugging along. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so anyhow, just sort of fast forward. So uh, there were some things that kind of happened last year because I was with the right people and I just happened to have my phone and my three access camera. I rigged up some stuff and I got a little bit of footage and I was just sort of following people around and so this year I'm like this is what I'm doing guys from a documentary perspective I've only been working on this for three years um not the span of the actual span of time right yeah so um and so I got a lot more of the some important bits this year which was good and it's now starting to allow me to to imagine what what some cuts would look like um, or at least the beginning of something that's worth people watching could interest them. So, so I was continuing to do more of that. And as I was walking around with Brian, you know, Brian's like, oh yeah, yeah, this is Alan and he's our archivist. So he started as like, Brian, you gave me a label, man. <laughs> Before it was just this thing I was working on and now he's, you know, and now people are calling me the archivist. So that's you should describe thing. yourself as like a, a fandom uh, paparazzo. No, yeah, no. Um, but and and so uh, I was able to film your niece, um, and I just have to I just have to get a thing with Carl, uh, and that will complete the Monroes. Um, 
and then uh so john was there and bill johnson was there but um mm-hmm. i i you know i since we did interview john um at your place just as just trying stuff out uh, you know uh in one of your rooms in your house um i redid that with him for about a half hour oh that's cool um, did you get any any cool footage out of it do you think oh uh, yeah and i got a lot of really good sort of um b footage this year mm-hmm um, so this is a thing that was kind of going on that, uh, one of the guys, Andy, he was always sort of asking to see if we could get an okay from the, the convention center, if they would let him get a, let, uh, Otakon buy a t-shirt gun. <laughs> so somehow. We can't just throw t-shirts out on the crowd. We've got to missile them out into the well, crowd. Well, if we only throw them, only the people in the first few yeah. rows can get them. Oh. If we have a gun, we can get them all the way to the back. <laughs> so I guess they wore them down because they said, okay, you can get a t-shirt gun. And then he didn't just get a single firing t-shirt gun. He got a Gatling gun. Well, he asked, wait, does that mean single shot only? <laughs> well, it's said, it's more like a like a revolver as opposed right, to a Gatling yeah. gun because it, it only, doesn't have auto fire. Right, it's not firing from all uh, all spots. It's only firing. <laughs> you have to sort of rotate it, and it fires again and again. So you can kind of have. It's not really rapid fire. It's like he's got a you know he's but got a hand s- manually. You can do still it. dispense half a right. half a dozen t shirts in like you know as many seconds. I have these uh, instant three sixty <laughs> action cams, um, and so I give them the A and V. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they they took the pendants and they walked around. They did time lapse. So it was really interesting. So I got a lot of footage of that. Oh, that sounds um, cool. But as I was retrieving stuff, um, and when open ceremonies happen, I took a lot of be- behind the scenes stuff, and then um, I took a little bit stuff of the stage. And right behind me was Andy with the Gatling gun, t-shirt Gatling gun. It's not really a gun, the t-shirt cannon, um, and. So I was nearby, and I, I got some footage that was a little grainy because it's dark. I was like, all right, when I go to closing ceremonies, because they're going to do it again, uh, I'll, I'll take these instant 360 cameras. And so I did, and I got some really wild shots of this footage. And it looks really sharp on the phone, so I won't know until I put it, look it on my big monitors here. Mm-hmm. Um, but it looks, looks pretty sharp. It looks pretty good. And uh, there were wild shots. You could see how far the the, the t-shirts were flying <laughs> across the room. And at some point, as they're reloading, we were just picking them up and we were just flinging them. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty fun. So, uh, you know, I had a really good time. And I got some, uh, I would say, much more meaningful for my purposes, uh, a ton of that video. Um, but I only got, like, seems to be my highest average is get, I could get maybe two two interviews. Uh, and usually people are like, uh, are you going to be interviewing on Sunday? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to be tearing everything down. I got to pack uh, everything up. Like when we load out at the con, like we don't get to sit around all day. Right. You know, and yeah, you it, do the convention for the morning and afternoon. And after that, yeah. it's like psh, strike. We got to like almost like triple our efforts right. to like tear everything down and get it back. Uh, and, into yeah, the pod. Well, and, and this year we had to be out of the building by midnight Sunday. Ooh, really? Um, How because come? there was another group coming in first oh thing Monday. God. So it yeah. was a very quick turnaround. So you don't even get to done. like load out on Monday morning. You had yeah. it done by midnight. Everything had to be on the trucks by midnight. Oh, yeah, oh that must have been a this grind. This is all my gear. And so I, I improved on, on, I reduced some of what I, I brought, which was beneficial to. Uh, how many Canadians I could pack into the car with some breathing room. Now that sounds like the setup to a joke, Alan. <laughs> um, so what I've been saying to people is like, oh yeah, I filled my car up with a lot of that this gear and two Canadians. <laughs> um, and uh, so that was an improvement for me. And I did make some improvements on like how I haul gear around. And I, now I have better insight on that um, because at least, you know, that worked out for me. So there are improvements to make before next year. Um, and in some ways they'll be meaningful, but, um, the key area for that is I just, I, you know, it takes me a couple hours to put everything together and it takes me a couple hours to pull everything apart and pack yeah. it, make sure I get all the little bits and pieces, um, that are meaningful. And then I got to drag it from the convention center back to the hotel 
um, and then unpack some stuff in the hotel and then go back with, you know, the things that I use to haul stuff so I can kind of containerize it all together for myself. So Sunday, I just shut down and I just go, you know, freelance with the uh, freehand with, you know, the camera. So, okay, cool. Yeah. So that's what I continue to do all weekend. Um, who did I see? I saw Bryce for like a brief moment. Um, I saw Jefferson for a brief moment uh, a couple times. Uh, he's sort of on registration staff, I guess now. So he was at Dead Dog. Uh, I guess I don't know how long he's been on staff. I think it's been more than a it's couple of years anyway. Than, registration is a good place to like right. meet a lot of different people. I right. mean, even though when they try and keep the line flowing as as fast as they humanly can, it's there's still opportunity to like greet people and exchange like a little bit of of words with them while their their stuff is processing. Mm. And the registration this team this year did an amazing job. Yeah, we did not have any lines at all. Oh, that's excellent. It yeah, was such once a, the once the booths opened up, you, you were able to like drain the lines pretty quickly complete turnaround from last year i mean in in 2022 we went from having about twenty five thousand people on site in 2021 to forty thousand people last year so that huge jump in attendance made it really difficult for us to Mm. be ready to handle that and a lot of time and effort went into improving the systems this year and there were no lines even at 9 a.m on friday Mm -hmm. There oh, was nobody in line excellent. to get in the building because yeah. our team did such an amazing job. So this yeah, is because I I know people who come to the con are always worried, like you know, are they going to be trapped in this interminable line at Reg? So this is the example of one of the things I wanted. I knew that I wanted to start with interviews in 2019 for the documentary as just a starting place, right? I need people to be talking about things and and tell me about some stuff that mm-hmm. might be follow up for later. Um, and what I wanted to do in 2020 was to, to sort of get some buy-in on some departments to allow me to do just kind of what I've been doing, follow people around, you know, for a little bit and capture some footage of, you know, what happens when your access control, what happens if, you know, um, I don't know, you don't want to do out of care for example, because that's that's a lot of privacy stuff. But what happens in A&V, right? Just follow some people around. And there are some departments I know really well, and they're very comfortable with me as a person. So for me to be sort of invading the space as things are going on, a little less of an issue. Um, but, you know, you still want to, I still wanted to capture every department. And so I tried to do that in 22. And I got to like, I don't know you, and I don't know, maybe I'll do it whenever I feel like, you know, Something's going on, and um, one of the moments is I was in this space with leadership, and uh, I brought up an issue about the line, and I happened to go out with the gimbal, and I walked the line for like six minutes, and I went around, and I followed it back, and you know, all the way around, and as it spiraled across, and I was showing them some of this footage, and they didn't realize how much of a problem there was with the line, ah. so they started to go out to the skywalk area and again with the gimbal and i took my camera out and i started filming and i watched the two of them go look on one side go look on the other side and then they went down to the escalators and they came down to the bottom and then brian was starting to make some phone calls and then all of a sudden in the scene is i see andy then his wife comes up and they're talking about these issues and then simon just happens to see what's going on because he's seeing him collect and he comes in in this lobby area so he comes around right into the you know in the frame of things and brian comes back and he's on the other side of the frame and i'm like see this is exactly what i needed I just need them wired up. I wish I had their audio. <laughs> and so I was like, all right. So I now know that I I have some context to put these people back in a chair um, and give me context and then walk me through what happened. And now we have really positive contrast, which is an additional follow-up. Now what happened, um, because they saw all this, they really went to action throughout the whole year to make this happen and the result was fantastic and plus there was a a, a, a a pretty good amount of feedback on it in the con feedback so this also Yay. gives me additional shape to get additional fault and the contrast of like when things go wrong and then people take action on it and how positive it comes out as a result 
One of the uh, senior leaders uh, told us a story on Saturday morning about something that happened when they were in line at Wild Bills, which is a company that comes and sells mugs that you uh-huh. can fill with soda over the course of the weekend. Yeah, yeah. And the person in front of them in line at uh, at Wild Bills was griping about the line at Wild Bills. I said, man, this line sucks. It's the longest line I've been in all weekend. I didn't even have to wait to get in the building, but I got to wait while I'm here at Wild Bills. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend just started laughing. And so I shared this story with the, the leaders of the registration team. And I said, this is the best compliment you never got. <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't a compliment to them, but it was actually a compliment to them. Yeah. <laughs> from from our side, we had actually recruited a group of taiko drummers uh, who have a Shisa oh, dragon yeah, costume. Oh, those guys are cool. And we asked them to come out first thing on Friday morning and walk the line to entertain people as they were waiting to get in the convention center. So mm-hmm. even if they had to be waiting for an hour... They would at least have this taiko drumming group coming by, the people in the Shisa costume. And we came out the doors of the building and we started walking down and there were no people. <laughs> there was no one. We came out of the, the top end of the North Building and we walked along and there was not a single con goer. And then we wow. came along to the South Building and there was nothing there. And it was only when we went around the corner and got to the entrance into the convention center that we finally ran into con goers waiting to get in the building because there was not a single person in line at 9.15 on Friday morning. Wow. Yeah. So what they did is they redistributed the kind of things that have to go through registration through different avenues and different corners and different parts of the building. Mm. And anything Divide that would have... Divide and conquer. Right. Anything like bag checks or weapon checks, like that's, that's going to create latency, you know, with sort of coming in different places. So um, really well thought out. It, it resulted in... And you have to keep in mind, this building is like 6.3 million square feet uh, and it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's only like two and a half a million square feet bigger than the last convention center. Um, but it, it feels much bigger. Right. And mm-hmm. so the way this place works is when people are in rooms, it slurps up everyone. And it seems like there's no one in, in the concourse and the hallways or very few people. Yeah, Cause I remember it, at Baltimore, it was just like the, the hallways were always, you couldn't walk a hundred percent full of people. Right. Or they turned it into the hangout party. Right. Mm. And so while well, you, people can kind of do that and they do that a lot on the skywalk area, which is fairly enormous. Um, you know, it, it, when this building is operating at its fullest, it slurps up 40,000 people and it doesn't feel like there's anyone there unless you go look in their rooms yeah and we've also got a lot of programming happening at the hotel across the road the marriott marquis this year Uh uh-huh so we can hold uh, several thousand people in the programming rooms over there at any given Mm. point in time oh okay what sort of stuff did you did you do in the hotel as opposed to the convention center so the hotel has uh, a couple of key rooms Uh, one Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Uh, The hotel has a couple of key rooms. One is called Featured Events, and that's uh, a ballroom that seats somewhere north of a thousand people. And there were a lot of events that always draw good crowds in there, like the uh, super art fight. Um, We also had (laughs) a number of the events that I was covering that I'll talk more about later from the idol space. So we had three different idol festivals that took Mm -hmm. place in Featured Events. And then the other space that we have is called Club Oda. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is a, a, another open floor room where we run workshops that are movement related uh, and also where the uh, formal ball takes place and where the dance on Saturday night happens. Um, so there's a lot of different programming happening in that space, too. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, OK, so a couple of things of note. So you mentioned the theme this year was trains. Yes. And actually, it was brilliant because they really leaned into it. Um, to the point, um, and I, you know, Matt, I didn't think to to get you one, um, but they had these train whistles, these wooden <laughs> wooden blocks you can blow. They're really great. Yeah, like they sound um, like an old steam train whistle. But they, um, and so you know, Simon, correct me on the logistics of this, but we uh, we worked with um, who did we work with in Japan for for regarding the train, like the the train companies or something. Japan Rail? We, I honestly, I don't have... Marvin was telling me this in detail and I was listening, but I wasn't really absorbing. Uh, I don't have all the information. I know we worked with the group that's looking to get like the maglev in from D.C. to New York. Right. They were there. Mm. Um, And we we worked with, I think it was Japan East, uh, Japan Rail East. Uh, That sounds familiar. Yeah. 
Um, but we work with them. And so what, again, we really leaned in on this, um, we as being the convention center, not me and Simon, um, but on the theme, and we got a legit train jingles made up for us, multiple. <laughs> And in so, English and Japanese. Yep. And every 15 minutes you would hear and you could hear it almost any part of the rooms. Obviously, less than a, you know, like a video room is something loud was going on in yeah. your room. If you were sitting in like gopher ops or you were sitting in um, con ops or in the like staff lounge area, every 15 minutes you hear the jingle off and then you would hear like a real train jingle in yeah. Japanese and English. All through the South Building, yeah. All through the, yep, all through the building. And I just, I looked at Andy and I said, you know, this is really Japanese and we should do more of this every single year. Because <laughs> uh, it really was, it was, it was really unique. It, yeah. it sounds like it was a very apt theme because, I mean, you've, you've not just got the, the, like, presence of trains in Japan. Like, you've got the Shinkansen and then just the omnipresence of, of like, commuter rail all throughout Japan. But it ties in with, uh, with anime because mm -hmm. there's this romance of the age of rail that you have in, like, Galaxy Express 999 and a lot of other shows that, that always just seem to feature somehow a train trip somewhere or another mm -hmm. even if it's like a high school show you're you're on the commuter train somewhere or if you're you know moving back to the countryside there's that long meditative train voyage to the railway station at the end of the line in the little hometown that you came from and thought you'd never go back to yeah. and you have everything from that to Bacano with the the whole story of the the heist on the train mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. shows like tetsuko no tabi which are actually all about train station otaku there's so much <laughs> of trains in is a part of a japanese culture yeah, yeah and it's it's sort of like a low-key stealth thing but uh, once you start looking into it it's like you turn it up everywhere but but this is just like a small little thing that really made otakon feel a little extra special and then obviously it's super relevant to the theme so, um yeah. yeah. They also built an archway at the base of the Grand Staircase that said, Welcome to Otakon Central Station. And like, that, uh -huh. it was really lovely to see the way they put all this together. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So we really, you know, as a con, we really leaned into the theme. And so Marvin was saying, because he's, he's sort of a, I, I don't know if he's a trained otaku, but he, he uh, apparently this has been a recommendation for a while, but he um, he's one of the people that sort of really pushed for it internally. Mm -hmm. Um, and he said something like, this has been going on for 15 years and a lot of people have been, you know, like members have been very vocal that they want that to be a theme. Um, and so it happened this year and this was really just the right kind of theme for us to lean in, in positive and fun ways. And I think that's the kind of stuff we should be doing more on, more of for our themes. Oh, that's really great. I'm so glad it, yeah. it finally happened and that, that everybody got a lot out of it too. Yeah. We have a lot of uh, Otakon train whistles. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that. Um, there they was, they uh, were giving them away at Otachan, so there were uh, uh -huh. a lot of families who will be very happy at the end of Otakon. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, they'll be tired of it. Um, but yeah, no, I was, I was in uh, the staff lounge, and uh, there was a guy coming in. He's like, oh, train whistles. And she's like, how many people are in your department? He's like, oh, I don't know, like 30. He's like, She's like, take a box. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, and she's like, oh, you want one? She's like, there's plenty over there. And I was like, yeah, I'll just take one. That's fine. And I, oh I, I stowed it away in the stuff I haven't unpacked, unearthed yet. Uh, um, I, I remember when I was a kid, my dad worked for, for a railroad. And so we were always. Oh, I really should have picked one up. For we you. were always getting things like, you know, engineer caps. Like we'd, we'd go to tourist sites that were like railroad related. So, you know, me and my sister would get like railroad caps and those wooden whistles that sounded like steam engine whistles. Uh -huh. um, just all that sort of stuff. I, I mean, you know, I was just going to put mine like up here, but I could give you the one I have. I don't know. I mean. I'm sure we could get them, but they're already packed away at loadout, right? It's yeah. like they're not going to unearth until next next year's Otakon, if that at all. No, no they can unearth them earlier because with the new office, we actually have oh, access right. into the pot, so it would be possible to get one. Yeah. Um, actually, I can ask maybe Nora to, to get one yeah, next time. He's yeah, Nora or Bianca would be the two. Yeah, because mm -hmm. he's uh, Nora's going to be down there because of that, you know, that problem with the pod. Um, 
Mm. So yeah, so I mean that was alligator the, infestation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, right the rainstorm here, freed them <laughs> right right here in the northeast um so so yeah i mean that's kind of the stuff i was working on um uh, and on um, simon i mean what are your highlights oh there's one thing that's unique to you but that's a different story <laughs> well there yes i i certainly had some unique experiences at this year's oticon so i think you were from, you were still doing uh workshops and, and programming and that sort of thing so I was still working with the workshops department, but I had moved on to a new role at Oticom this year. So rather than being a co-department head for workshops, I'm now an assistant division director in the programming division. So looking at okay, a, a broader okay. broader range of the programming. Um, within the workshops department, we had been running a wide variety of programming, and we realized after last year that it was actually too much for one department to run because each of the different streams we did required specialized training for the staff. Oh, really? And so trying to have a staff team that was trained on four different areas of work, working ah. in Oda Chan specifically with children, working in idle space on the idle performances, working in maker space, helping people with freeform crafting, as well as in the workshop rooms. Each of those requires different methodologies within the working rooms. Oh, so wow. we split into four different departments. Uh, so my job and Kevin's job is to help work with all four of those departments and make sure that everything is running smoothly there. Everybody has what they need. Everything runs smoothly. So exactly. Yeah. So that was a lot of the work that I was doing, but also um, the guest relations work for programming guests is now mm -hmm. part of the work of the programming division. So for the first time ever, I was helping to write contracts for guests and working to support guests at the convention. Uh, and I had the real pleasure of working with uh, Phoebe, who was our first ever idle space guest. Oh. Uh, she's an overseas idol from California, and we flew her and her uh, flew her out, and and her manager came as well uh, to the convention, and they uh, performed in the first idol festival. She had a, an hour long block on her own. She was part wow. of opening ceremonies. She was the halftime show at Masquerade. She hosted the new idols. Uh, session we did. She ran a workshop for us, so she did a tremendous amount of programming. But she's an incredibly sweet and, and lovely person to work with, and uh, I, I got to spend a lot of time uh, helping her at the convention and uh, making sure that she was able to get what she needed and, and do the things that she uh, was going to be doing. And there were a lot of events back to back that we had to help to get her to. Um, so that was a real highlight for me was getting to work with her and also to learn a bit about how guest relations happens because while I've known that it's there that's yeah. one thing but understanding all the intricacies of how to actually work with guests is a, a different thing so that was a pretty steep it's, learning it's, it's curve it's a whole world it's a whole different world isn't it <laughs> it is absolutely and it, it meant I spent far less time than usual actually in the workshops area so uh, when your niece Cora was here on the first day she came looking for me and they couldn't even find me on the radio because I was busy doing guest <laughs> relations stuff over in the hotel uh. and the, the radio couldn't reach me so it was only the next day that I was able to, to see Cora um, <laughs> that I, I did get to catch up with her eventually but uh, it was a, a very busy convention from that side. And then for the last three years, I've also been sitting on the board of directors. Um, so uh, Oticon is the annual meeting of Oticorp, the corporation that runs Oticon. Yeah. So the board has to meet every day to keep that meeting going. So in addition to mm. doing my work for the division, I'm also doing work for the board at Oticon. So it makes for a very busy, yeah. um, busy time. But uh, it was really wonderful to be able to see some of those things. And I did catch a few of the highlights. Um, I think my two favorite things from within the workshops family, as we call it, that all the departments that mm -hmm. used to be workshops. Well, I'll talk about three, I guess. If, can I talk about three? Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> you As many as you need. I won't keep you all night, I promise. Um, so the first thing was actually the idol festivals because... Yeah, what is, what is an idol festival? So, well, idols are uh, people who are singers and dancers who are often doing mm -hmm. covers of anime tunes or K-pop or other mm -hmm. such songs but also often doing their own um, uh, individual music uh, that they've written themselves. Um, and we began several years ago to have an idol festival where we would bring in a bunch of different idols and, and give them the opportunity to perform at Oticon. Oh, okay. And so we've been running that, which we call the Anabeat Idol Festival, for several years now. 
Wow. Um, but last year, because it was part of workshops, what I really wanted to see was uh, a way of learning because workshops is all about learning new skills, trying out new things, yeah. um, learning and developing something over the course of the time that you spend at whatever the program is. So I said that I thought it would be really cool if Otakon could become a place where you could not just come and watch idols perform, but you could learn to be an idol. Ah. So we developed a program that we called Now Presenting, which is a space for idols who've never performed before to have their first ever onstage performance. Ah. Um, so we run a Now Presenting Festival, which is our second festival. And then we also added, so we ran that last year for the first time. And then this year we added a third festival called the Cosplay List. So mm -hmm. it's for idols who are particularly cosplaying within a, a milieu or a show or whatever. Um, so they've added that layer of cosplay on top of the performance that they're doing. Um, so we had those three festivals over the course of the weekend, as mm. well as having the Idol Space guest. So it was really great to see that growing. And Otakon is really developing a reputation as a strong Idol convention uh, because of all the work <laughs> we're putting in. So it's been really great to have that. So uh, yesterday when I was going back up to my hotel room, um, when I took my first break of the weekend at seven o'clock on Sunday night uh, <laughs> to grab dinner quickly before I had to go and take the staff photo, I was going up in the elevator and the guy on the elevator next to me saw that I was in a staff shirt and he said to me, this is the fourth anime convention I've gone to and it's the best one ever. Yay. And I said, well, thank you so much. Uh, have you been to previous Otakons or were these other conventions that you've been to before? Uh -huh. And he said, no, I, I came here for Phoebe, who was, of course, the idol guest that oh. we had. And so my heart breaks because I was the one who <laughs> arranged for Phoebe to be like, here. You know, hanging out with her the whole weekend. Exactly. And so I said to him, well, where did you come from? And he says, I flew in from Hawaii. Oh, my gosh. So we had a fan fly from Hawaii to Washington, D.C. Wow. to come and see Phoebe at Otakon. Oh, wow. So that's the reach that we're getting with the idol programming that we do. And, and so I'm just thrilled to see how well that's going and watching the, the new talent coming up at Now Presenting, mm -hmm. getting the opportunity to be in the featured event stage at Otakon for their first ever performance as idols. And just seeing this grow in this community is just wonderful to be part of. So that's one thing I was really pleased with. Mm -hmm. The second thing was our makerspace, which is the freeform crafting room, yeah. which we've been running since 2018. And this year they had the brilliant idea of doing makerspace at night. Okay. And so what they did is they said, we're going to, to build a time in in the evening because people keep asking us to extend our hours. Mm. We're going to dim the lights and we're going to bring out glow-in-the-dark paint and glow sticks <laughs> and ah. let people craft for like four hours with all kinds of glow-in-the-dark things. And they had like um, lamps that put starlights on the, the walls and the ceilings, and they just made a that wonderful kind of ambiance. Cool, actually. I, I mean, I wish I knew about that. I would have filmed some of it. <laughs> yeah, well, Angie actually did a, did film some video, so we're going to get that okay. footage from her. Oh, good. Because um, it looked it just looked absolutely fantastic. Yep. But I think my favorite thing of the weekend was a group who put in an application mm -hmm. to do a perler beads, so fuse beads workshop mm. on Pokemon. Right. But they said they wanted it to be 18 plus. And of course, Why we're thinking plus? <laughs> this is going to get creepy with Pokemon with giant boobs and genitalia uh -huh. everywhere. And when the workshop started, the line was absolutely enormous for this thing. They got the room filled up mm -hmm. and they said right at the beginning, OK, there are going to be no Pokemon penises, no Pokemon breasts in this. Uh huh. And we expected that people would get up and leave, but not a single person got up and left. And then the pre presenters said, what we want to do is we want to have a space where grown-ups can come and do a workshop where they can just come together and make something that's something that they loved and they grew up with because Pokemon is 25 years old now mm -hmm. and do it without having a whole pile of kids in the room. Oh, okay. So they made an 18 plus workshop just so that <laughs> they would be able to let adults come and just yes. have some time to do something fun for themselves that was just making Pokemon. There was nothing this, dirty about it. Yeah. It was just an adult's only this activity. This is a safe space for grown-ups. Um, the the 18 plus wristbands, you know, area, mm -hmm. I had witnessed a lot of people going through there that it was open seven hours, like for several days, uh, you know, each day, like seven hours. And they were always busy. 
So there are mm. some 18 plus events and they're just all busy. And it, it it's really just to exact, exactly what you just said, Simon, is not to be completely dirty. It's just to be able to have fun without kids. Um, well, some of them get a little dirtier than that. No, they're definitely but... 18 plus that are, are, are absolutely by design. We're 18 I'd, plus I'd and we are dirty. Risque. Yeah. Yeah, but this one, this one was just yeah, literally about giving a space for people to come and do this as grown-ups, and yeah. we, I just thought it was brilliant when we we heard that that was the plan, and the the presenters from that actually wrote to us already today to thank us so much for the opportunity to do it and how much they love being there. So yeah. that was really lovely. Yeah. So for me, those are some of the highlights. Um, but I will say I managed to do something that I've been saying for years is the only way I could do more work at Oticon. Because, oh. <laughs> like I said, my, my first break came at 7 p.m. on Sunday, so I'm working from, you know, 7.30 in the morning till 2.30 in the morning every day. Yeah. And I've always said the only way I could do more work at Oticon is if you cloned me. Uh, uh, yeah. And lo and behold, there I was for the entire weekend on the main con- concourse right outside the con ops hallway uh, because there was a life-size picture of me that was taken and ah. printed and put on a cardboard backing. Yeah. Uh, with the, the hashtag Dan Simon across the chest uh, ah. that, that was there for almost the entire convention, uh, keeping an eye on what was going on in the space. So, you know, so, so the, the head of, of um, publications, right, you know, Simon knows him and he comes walking in and he makes a, a joke. Um, and then I stacked onto it and it turned into... Um, a cardboard stand-up of Simon based on a picture we took at the moment. And it said, and you got to add hashtag ban Simon, which is really just an internal joke, um, which is now being memed inside because now everyone is, mostly people are are inside on the joke. Um, So we should probably talk about, and I'm sure we talked about this in the past, but let's talk about what ban Simon means um, from the internal joke, because we, we should bring others into this, in the loop of this. Yeah, well, and it is kind of important to do that, because even at the convention, people were saying, you know, why are they being so mean to Simon? And <laughs> why is he laughing every time they do it? Uh, and the answer is that this uh, ban Simon started because in 2020, we, of course, had to cancel the, the in-person convention because of COVID, mm-hmm. but we didn't want to not do anything. So a decision was made to hold Oticon online. Yeah. And we had a convention with six different programming room rooms on Twitch for eight hours on a single day. So we had 48 hours of content. And in order to run that, we needed to have moderators in the chats because we didn't oh, yeah. want to have anybody being disruptive or causing problems or any of that sort of thing. It's always better to have moderators in chat for these platforms. But we needed a lot of moderators because we had to do eight hours of programming in six different channels at the same time. Yeah, so that's a lot. we had to train a bunch of people. Um, but one of the tricks is that when you're a moderator, you can't be banned. Right. Because you have admin control over the channel. So I had said to the person who was running the trainings, why don't I come on and join your training events and your people can practice. It's just a regular person. It's just a regular, my just my normal everyday Twitch account. Yeah. And then you can practice banning me. <laughs> so I came on the, the calls with them. And, and as she was doing trainings for this is what we're doing. This is how we're going to do it. Here's the system of warnings we'll give people, all that sort of thing. I was being a complete troll in the chat. <laughs> And so I was, I was, because I was also testing the, the capacity of their internal bots to see what they could catch and what they couldn't. Yeah. So, you know, could I swear? Well, of course, the, the basic swear words were mm-hmm. really, they're not going to get through. But could I swear on other languages? Could I put spaces between them? Could I put ASCII art that looked dirty? <laughs> like, what could I do to mess up the chat? Uh-huh. And then when I tested all the things I could there, I just started trolling the mods and, you know, insulting them and, and this sort of thing. And then they would begin to ban me and ban me and ban me and ban mm-hmm. me. And so over two or three training sessions... So they sessions, got their, their practice in, they got so the they, practice. they understood how the mechanism worked. They could learn how to ban people permanently, how to ban for a couple of minutes, how to message people privately about bans, how they could reinstate someone who'd been banned. They needed to know all the technical aspects. Mm. And so I was there for them to practice that on. And I was also giving them a taste of this is what it can be like when you have a total jerk in your chat stream. Yeah. 
right? So that was the job that I'd said I was going to do. And then one of them put, you know, hashtag ban Simon in the chat on one of those those days. And of course, everyone starts laughing. Yeah. And so then the day of the convention came, the, the actual live con. And my job was to be a producer on one of the six rooms that we had. So I was in the room all day long. And of course, mod started popping into the room just to ban me. <laughs> <laughs> because why not, right? And so they started putting hashtag ban Simon into the chat with all the members there as well. And then it started popping up in some of the other channels. Uh, and then at the end of the day, they did a, a video interview with three or four of us who'd been involved in planning and running the convention to talk about the, the pivot and the way we'd put this all together and, yeah. and all the rest of that. And I was one of the people who got interviewed and so as I'm talking on the, the live video stream, of course, the hashtag Dan Simon starts <laughs> popping up in the chat again. Uh, and then when we have our member meetings for Otacorp, the, the mm -hmm. charity that runs Otacon, um, it's a, an online meeting, particularly through that pandemic time. And so, of course, anytime I would say something on those meetings again, people would toss in the <laughs> hashtag Dan Simon. Uh, so it just became this little running gag that has been continuing for three years now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so Alan was kind enough to remember the little running gag and make sure it got well, plastered I, across I, my chest. I, I moderated. So he comes in and so so he comes in the pubs and, you know, again, they know each other really well. And so Simon has this joke, which is... Uh, well, it's, a, it's an old George Carlin routine. Mm. And George Carlin used to say... I'd like to get a tattoo of myself, a full body tattoo, only taller. <laughs> so I came into publications and their job is to print anything that we need for the convention. And I said, I have a publications request for you. I would like a full body temporary tattoo of myself, only taller, because that ah, way it would be printed right. on paper. And of course, everyone laughs. But then Nori, who runs pubs, gets this look in his eye. And then I said, which just in the moment, I said, it should be a cardboard stand up. And then hesitated for a half a second. I said, it should have hashtag ban Simon. And his eyes lit up. And he's like, we're taking a picture right now. Go stand over at that wall. And he did this, you know, Simon did this thing. This jaunty uh, pose. I, I yeah. stood up and posed proudly. And then I left because I had to go back to the other yeah. work I was doing. And an hour later, I got a text message from Nori saying, exactly how tall are you? Yeah. <laughs> And so I told him. And yeah, and so I went. I went to sort of. I'm sort of doing the walk, just checking rooms, just to see what's going on, see if there's anything worth filming, just you know, see how people are doing. Um, and I, I'm walking along the concourse, and I see, I see what was basically um, duct taped to one of the pillars, and I get to the programming room, and I see Simon there, and I say, oh, I just saw you in the concourse, and he's like, I heard, <laughs> and then I, I was like, all right, hold on, let's go take video of this, and so he walked out, and there's, you know, I caught a little snippet of, of him. Uh, he's like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to see myself as others see me for the first time ever. Yeah. So there was a yeah, life-size Simon making his way around the con. And then, uh -huh. then I was asked if I would sign it. So I did. But he's shorter than you. Well, it was almost life size because Nori didn't have enough uh, enough cardboard to actually make one my size. Because <laughs> for those of you who can't tell how tall I am on a, an audio format, I'm six foot four. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So I mean, I I'm only partially responsible for the quality. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? But I don't. Uh, I, I, you know, it's fine. I don't. I, I won't I take know. it back. Otakon has but... got a got a great tradition of of stand up art. I mean, the very first Otakon, um, we had a couple of stand ups. I think we had like Bean Bandit and Lum and Ranma Chan and Pichan from Ranma One Half. Um, I'm sure there were there were a couple of others that I'm forgetting about, but. There's just something really cool about having like life-size stand-ups of your favorite anime characters. There is. Around. I just never, ever thought I would see a life-size stand-up of me. <laughs> but, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I always... This is, uh, this is what makes Otakon fun for staff with Well, each exactly. Other. I, I always try and support this kind of thing and, and instigate this kind of thing because these little moments of laughter and lightheartedness make, what it, we need. make it yeah. so much better for people who are working their tails off mm -hmm. for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And so when you can get them laughing and engaging it's wonderful and uh just to, to culminate the band simon story because this was <laughs> this was probably the most touching part even though it should have been insulting um was every year i take the staff photograph at the end of of Otacon, mm -hmm. and we get the you know we have 750 staff who help put this event together and we get as many as possible uh 
like on that big stairwell on, on that big stairwell yeah and i go up on the overlook and i take uh, the, sh the photograph down at them yeah but when you're wrangling six or seven hundred people to, to take a photograph of them it takes a while to get everybody into space into the, the right place so I was standing up on the overlook, as I always am, waiting for things to get ready. And then coming from down below, I hear this chanting of, Ben Simon, Ben Simon, <laughs> Ben Simon. Yeah, and I would say out of maybe this, this not all 700, but, you know, a fair amount. But there was probably a good 100 people that were in unison, Ben Simon, Ben Simon. So now it's a, it's a, it's a well-loved, memed, and, and, and it's understood um and maybe members don't understand but at least for you guys in our discord i i posted a picture of matt you responded like don't ban simon i said <laughs> we'll talk about it on the show yeah, that's right i i actually am not banned it's there because i was helping out oticon and i think it's hilarious and i love it right. uh, uh, and i well it's really it. cool now that it, they're not going to sell shirts they're not going to sell shirts but it's a good inside joke now that you guys are all um aware oh of yeah it. Like um, there's there's like bunches of people on staff where they've got their own little running gags. Like mm -hmm. I've got a fan club for no reason. Uh, well, there yeah. various people have got all sorts of other you running made this, gags. So uh, Sue's husband took a picture of you where you were making this sort of Popeye, you know, like eye look or whatever. <laughs> yeah, Popeye scowl. Yeah, and so he took that and I don't know, he like they, they it was it got Photoshop or something, it. and they made these sort of large, you know, two inch buttons out of it. And um, then then Sue made a, a Facebook group that you have to be invited <laughs> to. And so I'm in that group. So I'm in the fan place and, you know, fan club. And so she had a bunch of people. And after all this, she's like, oh, we got to take a picture of this. So I got a couple pictures from it. Not that I'm going to share that publicly with anyone. I got to send that to Sue. Uh, but, yeah, there's a there's a small crowd of people just in the fan place and, you know, club <laughs> and uh and yeah so and i think i what i'm hearing is the new buttons are coming i don't know we gotta find i gotta get a good scan of that original pics so i think i have <laughs> i have a graphic somewhere but i don't mm -hmm. i don't you know i have to go dig it up i don't know where i have it so yeah so anyway um you do anything else at the con simon <laughs> well i didn't sleep much that's for sure <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah, most of my time uh, was working with the idle stage and working with Phoebe mm -hmm. um, and then trying to keep the rest of the, uh, the, the department stuff going. running smoothly, yeah. um, liaising with uh, all the other departments and, and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, I think I didn't get to see anything of the con, right? Oh. I, I don't get to attend events, that sort of thing, but that's yeah. not what I'm there for. I'm there to, to put the show on. Yeah. Um, but for me, the... In addition to seeing the amazing work that is being done by these departments and, and these mm -hmm. guests, is the little quiet moments, uh, you know, one o'clock, one thirty in the morning, when you can sit down for a couple of minutes while the last of the programming is running, mm. and just have a, a drink of water and chat with people for you know five or ten minutes before you have to get back up, and that's the the few moments you have to catch up with the friends you only see once yeah. a year. Uh, and that those are really special moments, uh, even though we're all exhausted and talking about the particular issues that have come up that day. We're doing it together. We're solving problems together. And it's that community, that family of the staff. That's and there's lots so of important. Yeah. fun moments that we cannot talk about on mic. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. There is nothing to see here. Please move along right. or you will be banned. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's lots of those moments that you have it as what time I was just saying sort of late at night. You all get punchy and and, you know, it's just, it's just all fine. Yeah. It's okay. all good. Well, um, were, were there any um, particularly notable things about, like, guests or, or like, big events that, that you heard that, that went off well or I think conversely we're, were horrible catastrophes? <laughs> one of the, the big things was that we had a huge push on Macross this year. Oh, yeah? Um, so we had Kawamori-san and Tenjin-san uh, who were there and they did uh, a long, I think it was a two hour panel they had and they had autograph sessions and yeah. uh, meet and greet. And, and that was really quite wonderful. Uh, and I actually, uh, I didn't get the chat with them, but I did see them in the green room um, when I was in there with Phoebe at one point. So it was uh, really quite neat to see that. And they had a, a large uh, Macross uh, Mecca in mm -hmm. the dealer's hall. Um, wow. And yeah, lots of stuff. And there were a lot of long time uh, staffers at Oticon 
who were, you know, some of the folks who were around when Oticon first started, who, like me, grew up on Robotech. Mm -hmm. um, so having the creators of Macross there was really special for those of us who are, are fans from that particular era. Um, so from the guest side, that was one of the big pieces. Uh, the musical groups are always uh, a huge draw. Uh, and we actually had uh, a variety of musical acts that were happening over the weekend that were really well received, as always. Uh, we also had a bunch of like TikTokers who mm -hmm. were there. Yeah, we I, I saw that. That was something I, I thought was interesting, that they were people that put their phone up on a trash can and they would be doing their dance. And, you know, you don't, they don't, there's no music. We don't hear the music. Um, and it would be bad anyways to record it out loud because all you would hear is, you know, con. Is room noise. Noise, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, you see these people sort of dancing in silence and then maybe they're listening to them in their, you know, earbuds or something like that. But I saw a lot of that. Um, easily a good dozen instances of that. Like happening. they're doing like a Min May yeah. dance or something? Uh, well, there, well, so the origin of, of TikTok actually started with a, an application called Musical.ly. And it was sort of an opportunity where they, they sorted out licensing deals with all the big uh, music companies. And so really the origin here is that what they wanted is they wanted to have a thing where people want, were able to like dance with license free, pick from whatever the catalog uh -huh. and do their little dances. And that's what TikTok uh what musically was until it got bought and then they changed the name to TikTok and then it became that but also uh, all this other short you know span uh, content um so so to see that trend was really interesting but it was really interesting like you know without context it looks really odd to see you know two people in their cosplay dancing you know I don't apparently know. Yeah. to nothing <laughs> but I mean, I get it because they do this at home and uh -huh. now they're at Oticon in their cosplay. So I guess it makes sense to, you know, kind of do this. In we're the doing atmosphere. it anyway. Yeah. Might as well be a little bit extra about yeah. it. Yeah. But not only were people recording themselves, we also had famous TikTokers right. as panelists and guests at, at Oticon. Right. Oh. And a lot of um, the, the younger fans, mm -hmm. that's who they're there to see because mm -hmm. that's really? where they consume media. Ah. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, they're they're coming at 12, 13, 14 years old and they're wanting to see these uh, these TikTokers that they follow and have a chance to meet them and ah. shake their hand. And just like we get excited at the Kawamori sons, <laughs> they're getting ex excited at these TikTokers. Uh -huh. And so it's great to see Otakon adapting to where fans are today. Mm. And for me, it's one of the things that is amazing about being a, a convention that really is by fans for fans. Yeah. So yeah. we're we're trying to keep up with where the people who are the fans of East Asian culture are at. Right. So like the idol space is a good example of adapting to that, right? For me, do I, I, it's not my thing. So it's not like I would get it. But there are people that are into it and bringing Phoebe is, was a very big thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I am not an idol, um, but I have been so welcomed by that community yeah. as I've been working with them from the last several years that uh, it, it makes me feel like I'm part of it, even though I am not, nor will I ever be an <laughs> idol performer. Sorry, guys, you're never going to yeah. see me on stage with my pen lights. Uh, if, I, if I see you in a uh, 3D CG uh, anime and our season reviews, things are over. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of having K-On, we'll have Simon. <laughs> oh, God. That is, not a, that is not a meme. Let's not start that, people. <laughs> it will be banned before it even starts. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, no, it, it really is great to see how um, Otakon is able to cater to such a wide mm -hmm. range of people. And I think that's part of why we have so many people coming to the convention. I and mean, we were mm -hmm. at almost 42,000 people on site this year. It was another wow. record. Um, and so despite having that many people there, we, everything ran so smoothly, yeah. but the fact that we had so many members coming shows that last year wasn't an anomaly, mm -hmm. but it is that we are such, uh, an incredible experience for the people who are into all these different aspects of East Asian culture, video games, manga, mm -hmm. anime, uh, live action, uh, video TikTok, games, video yeah. game, like yeah. all of it. Anything. We try and role play. We have tabletop role playing games from Japan there, right? Like we have <laughs> we have LARP. We have all kinds of stuff going on. AMVs, all this stuff happening at Otakon. There's all there's going to be something there for everybody, 
uh, who's into whatever aspect of this culture. Mm -hmm. And it's a place where you can come and be yourself and be accepted and respected for liking what you like and find other people who love it as well and make friendships and learn and uh, just be part of celebrating all these this culture. And it's just a, a wonderful thing to be part of. And, and you know, so the way AV is today, you know, I, I legitimately don't have anything to do with it, but I'm very proud of my friends and them um, getting the support they needed, you know, from the right people at Otakon to give the growth. And it's very clear that members um, love everything that 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 department, that team is doing um, because they are all basically always packed. Um, mm -hmm. and they, they sort of run a little mini con inside the con, um, with, you know, with their focus and, um, it's very amazing to see how very effective and efficient and how some of their, uh, strategies and things that they've done, um, have been sort of borrowed and improved on in other parts of the convention. Um, and so it's really interesting, Matt, you know, from your perspective, it's just a contest, but it is so much more than that now. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just amazed at, at how sophisticated uh, the modern AMVs are. I mean, yeah. I mean, literally, when I started this, this this was back in the days when you were like chaining two two VCRs together, yeah. and and over the course of my tenure, it started to get digital and more and more digital, and um, actually pretty sophisticated. Nowadays, people are just doing amazing things. Um, with their AMV projects that, that I am just like in awe of. And I, you know, I am, I'm glad to have par, partaken in helping um, a lot of these, you know, a lot of the technology and the gear get to a point that it was portable enough for us to start digitizing these contests. Now, mm -hmm. I mean, in the, nowadays, all the content's coming in digital. Nothing is, you know, coming in analog, really. Um, uh, yeah, but gone, I remember gone are the days of super right. VHS and, you know, master tapes. The person who really started this was Patrick with AWA, um, and then you know mm -hmm. him and I sort of prototyped in and brought the servers down to a size that was more manageable and portable. And then Vic and I kind of took this to a next level, and then Vic took it to you know the there nth three level, three levels beyond that. Yeah, yeah, and down to like to a professional level, and then when he you know, we were already sort of doing these things elsewhere, but we got it to a point, um, and and then he just kept iterating on it. And then when Otakon gave him the support he needed, he had that you know support he needed to iterate it on it more. And now they really run their own thing, and it's it's just um, it's it's you know you would always AVs always kind of took a third of whatever was going on or half of whatever was going on at the con. People go to the masquerade or they go to the AMV contest, mm -hmm. right? And they, there were people who didn't want to do either and there was, you know, it was a little of that. Um, but, but... <laughs> I'm here most, for the dealer's room and nothing else. But the biggest events way. that happened, um, uh, you know, and stuff happened in video game hall. Like they had their big events, but like the masquerade <laughs> and the AMV contest like took... You know, that's when the BCC sort of sucked up all the people. They was because, you know, more than two thirds, like 80 percent of them were in those two events. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I had have the uh, the masquerade over at the arena because you needed the space for, for the crowds. And yeah. Yeah. AMV would have like a big, a big video theater, sometimes the biggest video theater yeah. and, or, run and twice and an, and an over and an overflow room. Yeah. And then, you know, as that, that, as the con grew in the BCC, as, as we, you know, grew up, mm. uh, as we sort of, it, it grew a lot. And, you know, I, I always found it was interesting because, um, not to pat myself on the back, but for the stuff that I was doing and providing that content, uh, I just always called it the third tempo of 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 some of the events because there were times where there was no other schedule other than to schedule a direct competition to AMV, direct competition to Masquerade. And so, you know, I just I just sopped up the remaining 5,000 for my two hours. 
and they would pack the thing. And to the point when we had record executives because of music guests sneak in there and then then they see people in the big hallways dancing to those music videos uh, to set artist songs. Like it just gave us a, a unique sense of support. Um, and it's just weird. You know, mm-hmm. it's weird to see that 5,000 go over here, 5,000 go over here. Well, where else do we go? We're going to go see this. And I just, it was interesting to, <laughs> to see that uh, happen. And AVs is a very, a very key thing for Otakon. And, you know, in its origin in history, Matt, you have a lot to do with that, yeah. which is also, um, I have a lot to do with everyone copying your format, which has made, AMV content is basically a standard of how they function and operate. Yeah, and it's and it's kind of an interesting dichotomy because AMVs can be very, very individual, personalized thing. Like when when you make an anime music video, you're the only one who could make that anime music video, or even if it is a a concept that's been like done before, um, to make that music video that way. It's it's very much a medium of of personal expression, and then it's it's kind of like funky where you take it to a convention and like you know hundreds of people will watch it and then they'll, and they'll get really big into it. Yeah. Um, okay, so Simon, would was there anything else that we needed to cover? Because would we, you like to talk, talk more about how wonderful AMVs are? Yeah, I mean we've been talking for a while, and, well, and we did this sort of without any real guidance, or at least I did. <laughs> I've only actually been to the con the uh, contest once at Otakon, but I must say I love the way the contest is run. I did get to go to the AMV theater for the first time ever, uh, specifically into that room at Otakon this year, because one of the staffers there, Mel, who uh, Alan mm-hmm. Alan is known for a long time, and I met finally for the first time in person <laughs> at Otakon this year. Uh, she did a little thing for staff saying, um, sign up, pay $5 for charity, and then if you walk 5,000 steps or do five kilometers over the course of the convention, yeah. come and show me and I'll give you a pin for your badge. Um, and oh, she really? had hundreds of staffers sign up for this thing and raise money for charity. And oh. uh, and now she said one of the, the knock-on effects of that is that we have had more staffers visit AMV theater than we ever have in the past because they had to come <laughs> and find her, and she's always in that room all weekend. <laughs> so it's done wonders for AMV theater and raising its profile throughout the convention. Uh, but I think one Yay. thing actually, one other thing to say is that they re-ran the contest from, I think it was 1995. 95, yeah. Um, yeah, they, they so, ran 94s last year. Yeah, so Which, they're going back and doing 30 years ago Matt, anime oh, cost, wow. contests. Matt, may me, remind me, yeah. since you're here, I need to, I need to find like an SSD drive or something to copy stuff off that you can, oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. You can get a copy of. Because I have, I have a bunch of that sitting on the hard drive. I have the 94, Certainly. all the stuff from your tapes and, and yeah. more than that. So Yeah, but the the 5K, of course, there there are some people who are stuck in one room for the whole weekend. So for them, 5,000 is, or, you know, a lot of steps. <laughs> and then there are those of us who never stop walking. And so right. our joke was always, oh, well, we'll have the 5K by breakfast, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will. She's like, I asked her, I said, all right, when do we start recording? She's like, when you got here, it's like, oh, I already hit it. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was, I was talking to her Thursday morning. I was like, you know, just today I already hit. I was like, I, I'm already like, oh, you know. yeah, just just even doing setup for the convention. Yeah. You're running yourself crazy all the yeah, time. Yeah, so we, I, we I did, did some back of the hand general math, and I did basically from we got in like Wednesday, you know, afternoon. Um, and I stopped counting it at some point at like maybe five o'clock or something on Sunday. <laughs> um, and I, I, it was basically 42 miles. That's how much I walked around, uh, the weekend. And that's not even, that's nothing compared to a lot of people. I mean, Simon, how, how many? Yeah, I hit 55 miles and Kevin mm-hmm. beat me by 0.7 of a mile. Uh, cause Kevin and I have been comparing step counts for years. Um, oh, and, he always beats me and easily beats me in terms of number of steps because he has short legs. 
but uh, but he beat me by 0.7 of a mile over the the time we were both on site. Now, to be fair, I was there Wednesday afternoon and he wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, but because I was doing a lot of work being in one room for the idol festivals yeah. and, and the work I was doing with guests and that sort of thing, it meant that he was doing a lot more roaming and I was in one place. But yeah, he he barely beat me on distance this year. <laughs> but I was, even with being in one room a lot of the time, um, I was about 115,000 steps over the course of the five days oh I was gosh. there. Oh, my gosh. It makes so, my feet hurt thinking about it. So <laughs> speaking of Mel, so when we, maybe it was a, it was a month ago we did the pre-screening room. And um, so I, 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 you know, I get to where I was going, where we're doing this, and I see Mel, and she was just closing her laptop. And she's talking about, I'm not going to say who this person is, but... Simon and I know this other person and Mel's like, you know, talking to this person and there was, I guess, some conversation because she's like, she repeated this things is like, I was just talking with her uh, related to, you know, Otakon things and like, and then we both like said, you know, Alan too. <laughs> and then when she's like, I, it's really going to be good to finally meet Simon is like, you know Alan too? And I'm just like, oh boy. <laughs> Alan is the glue that holds it. No, it, it together. really isn't. Like I'm only I'm only responsible for a few key people and you know, that's it. <laughs> I take no other responsibility. You can say that about a lot of people. There are I, a lot of people where yeah. where like there's surprising amounts of relationships that everybody right. has with everybody else that you don't know about. But I mean, you know, I I said to some I might have even said to Mel, it's like when when we brought him on board, I didn't think he would get this. He would go this deep. <laughs> well, the re I mean, the reality is that Otakon is something that I care about because right. of the community, because of the people, um, and because I have been a fan all my life. So it's yeah. an opportunity to give back, and I'm going to do whatever I can to give back. And, and if that means you know 500 hours a year of volunteer work, then right. that's what I'm going to do. And I will say Aww. for all the work you do, I you know thank you. No right. But you, it's you've not been, me. It's everybody. I mean, we're all doing it. You're right. working. You know, Matt did. How many years were you on staff, Matt? Twenty five. Uh, Twenty years, something like that. Yeah. So Matt did twenty plus years. I mean, I've only been doing this ten years. I'm a lightweight compared to you guys. So. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't, and you know, I keep remarking on it comically, but like, it only took me. It only took ten years before I said yes. I didn't want to overcommit myself because, and you know, you see this, right? People sort of. Um, it's a big commitment and mm -hmm. to do it right, especially if you're going to be in any kind of position of leadership uh, or a department head or running an event, it's important to get it right. Um, you know, it's important not to screw it up. And I was already sort of overstretching myself in personal life. So the last thing I want to do is say yes to something for Otakon and then not be able to follow through. Yeah. I mean, um, there there are a lot of people who've who've staffed Oticon over the years who um, got into it, did a really good job, but then after a while, they're just like, "Look, I've been doing this for X number of years, and I'm getting burnt out. I I need to like take a step back and just stop accepting more responsibility right. upon more responsibility." Yeah, and there don't get me wrong, the event. The event can go smoothly, but it, it has a lot to do with some very key people really working hard throughout the whole year. It is not just a single, you do your thing, your song and dance for, you know, just a few days and then you get all the accolades. It's it's for it to come together smoothly uh, or mostly smoothly. I mean, it's like a miracle that this thing can function um, is is a, is a lot of a lot of effort and blood and sweat throughout the year yeah. for very key people um, and hundreds of those individuals. Um, it's not just, like I said, a momentary thing. Right? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's a lot of, lot of dedication. And I, th I think a lot of people don't realize that it's entirely run by volunteers, um, that Otakon is an organization that is wholly volunteer run. Um, because yep. there's a lot of conventions out there that are for profit and that are being, you know, it's there to make money. And Otakon is not. We are there run by fans for fans. And it's, it makes a huge difference to have that. That, that philosophy underlying everything yeah. you do. It's like we're not here to, like, I don't know, charge people for, like, fast passes to the roller coaster. We're, we're I, here just to make sure that things happen and happen as well as we can make them happen. 
I, you know, I, I've always said, we're just not staff. We're not just staff. We're family. Uh, yeah. It's a really weird family. <laughs> uh, it's a very big family. Um, you definitely have your sh- strange uncles and your, your strange people who like to dress up. Um, you have your, you know, but it's but it's a really fun, strange family, and I love it. Um, and I I wouldn't continue to you know spend time and effort on things if it wasn't for the the people I I get to hang out with, you know, this one week a year. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, I mean, it's, it's not one big slumber party, but it's almost, <laughs> it's almost the case. Right? Well, a slumber party involves sleep. So it's clearly oh, not a slumber party. <laughs> it, it, yeah, that is true. It's very true. Yeah. You don't, yeah. uh, I mean, you could look, you could be staff and you can be, um, you could, you know, be a part of a team and you can sleep well and you can go see the events and you can have that whole time. Yeah. Um, you know, Simon's very deep at a upper level at this point. He's just sort of got there yeah. and invests a lot of time and energy in it. And sort of my role is uh, I still burn a lot of energy and time. I mean, you know, 42 miles just walking around. I get to be in a lot of places at once. Right. And I'm only one person. So I'm really yeah. the only one working on this. You project. need a cardboard cutout. I do not because that cardboard cutout can't do the work that I need it done to do. <laughs> so, well, if you put your little Insta cams in the eyes of the Allen cardboard cutouts all over the convention center, you could get all your footage. So the thing is, they like you know the AV crew like was having fun with it, and they're like, "I want to see some of this footage." And I will say, I want to see it on these big monitors how qual- how the the quality looks. But um, you know, so Andy was he comes up and. Uh, He's like, so do you have, and I go, yes. And I go, well, let's go check out the, the t-shirt cabin. Because I was like, maybe we can mount it on the top or something. That was it. And he's like, I love you, man. But that was it. And we went, we looked at it. He's like, oh, you know what? Next year, I'm going to go add this. And we can put a photograph of Mount here. And, all. and so what I did is I took this sort of selfie stick thing that I had with it that extends like a few feet up. Yeah. And I got some pretty good shots behind it. Um so even if we go like got the shots of it, you know, things, you know, firing out of the cannon, that's great and everything. But it was better to kind of be above and sort of like, you know, the drone shot above him where you can see it go into the crowd and go really far. <laughs> um, so I'm just I'm hoping that the uh, like, you know, the the um, because it was dark in there. Right. So I hope it's really good. So um uh, yeah, I was sort of reviewing a lot of that footage and uh, last night, you know, that was my decompressing to work a little more instead of <laughs> sleeping. Uh, it was only till like maybe 2 a.m. I crashed out and then I, I heard everyone else coming in the All room. All of a sudden, I just have this like weird mental image of like people in a dark cavern being swooped upon by like vampire t-shirt bundles. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, they were, you, could, you could see them coming and people are just like, you know, across the room were just like uh you know hold their hands up and so when we were manually flinging them it's surprising how far you can check those things <laughs> so uh yeah so it was fun it was really fun um it felt it felt pretty good this year for me i think um and then you know for the stuff that i was doing it's putting enough time in and getting enough material that's allowing me to imagine what the the start of something could be you know Mm-hmm. And that's really key because I, um, people have said we really, you know, they're like, can we start cutting cutting things yet? Are you done yet? And I'm just like, <laughs> it, it takes a while, right? You you can't invent the shape of something until you you have the material for it. So that's what I'm working on, and it's it's going at a pace that you know might get is getting to a point where um, I can start to envision stuff that can get cut together that could be more than five minute clips you know? mm. okay yeah. yeah so um okay so i think that was plenty um we've been going for a while now we should probably wrap up yeah say goodbye for now but thank you everyone we're gonna continue we're gonna go back to um our normal standard seasonal reviews um you know next week and um yeah, what are we up to uh summer season impressions part four for next week no oh, i think Something we're maybe like five or six i don't, I don't even know <laughs> we got like at least another 
two or three uh what was it paul's comment was something about i i was like oh well, we got like six more shows he's like bless you <laughs> but, so i think we have like 24 more things to watch so if we squeeze in maybe eight we can get maybe three more shows it might be three or four shows next wow so um it won't be long till they're halfway through the fall season before you finish reviewing that's a joke we season. always make and it's almost nearly true every time it's getting scarily close to becoming yeah. a truism yeah. yeah it's i hope it never dies mm. all right well thank you everyone for joining us this week hopefully you got some entertainment out of our tired butts uh you know talking about this and um we'll we'll talk to you all next week